While we all face personal barriers in our lives, our democracy also faces a massive barrier that needs to be overcome. It has an impact on every facet of our lives and our political system. Now the barrier that I'm talking about is something that you might have heard about quite a bit during the 2016 presidential election. Money in politics. It's a system that we have in place that corrupts our politicians, corrupts our lawmakers, and corrupts a system that's supposed to represent us. Bernie Sanders famously said various times, I think many people have the mistaken impression that Congress regulates Wall Street. The truth is that Wall, Street's, Wall Street regulates Congress. And when he makes those statements, he's talking about the reasons why our banking systems have a lack of regulations. He talks about why it is that some of the big players on Wall Street can lead to the meltdown of our economy and face no criminal charges or no retaliation for what they did. But there's also another element that money and politics impacts that I feel very passionately about, and that's our justice system. Now, our justice system has been influenced by corporations that donate unlimited sums of money to our politicians, and that in turn has an impact on who gets incarcerated, what gets criminalized, and how many people we put behind bars. Now, it's ironic that we refer to the United States as a land of the free, when in reality, we incarcerate more people per capita than any other country in the world. Now, the reason for that is because of the emergence of something known as private prisons. Right now in the United States, we have uh, two major corporations that run facilities under a private umbrella. That is Corrections Corporation of America and Geo Group. Now, to understand why it is that private prisons with a profit motive have come about, you need to kind of look at the history of the United States and some of the fear mongering that took place under certain administrations that led to the criminalization of things that might need rehabilitation as opposed to punitive actions, okay? So we need to look back at the Reagan administration to start. Under the Reagan administration, reefer madness started, right? Right now we have four states in the US that have legalized marijuana for recreational use. We have dozens of states that have legalized it for medicinal use. However, the federal government has listed marijuana as a Schedule I substance, indicating that it's one of the most dangerous things that someone can put in their bodies. It has no medicinal use, according to our federal government. Now, under the Reagan administration, there was this amplification of the war on drugs, but the Reagan administration specifically focused on marijuana and criminalizing those who were either trafficking the drug or in possession of the drug. So if you look at the numbers, you'll notice that in 1980, we had around 50,000 individuals incarcerated for non-violent drug offenses. These were people who got caught with some marijuana, some drug. Maybe they were addicted to certain drugs, but they didn't get re rehabilitation. They got thrown into our justice system, and they were incarcerated. Fast forward to 1997, and that number went up to 400,000. 400,000 non-violent drug offenders in our prison system. Now, business-minded individuals realized, hey, you know what, all of these state and federal prisons are full to the brim. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could make some money off of this? And that's when for-profit prisons, private prisons, came about. It's very symbolic because you notice an explosion of these facilities in 1984. It's very Orwellian when you think about it. In 1984, all of a sudden, you see these private prisons popping up, and they go to these state lawmakers, some cases federal lawmakers, and they tell these politicians, hey, look, we know how burdensome it is to have all these inmates in these prison systems. We know that these states might not even have the resources necessary to imprison all these people. So what we can provide a solution. You just give us some taxpayer money, we'll build our facilities, and we'll house all these nonviolent offenders. And that's exactly what happened. Now, as a result of private prisons, what you notice is we do incarcerate more people per capita than any other country in the world. Eric Holder gave a speech about this back in 2013. And he mentioned that even though the United States accounts for 5% of the world's population, the US actually accounts for 25% of the world's incarcerated individuals. That's an insane disparity. So why is that happening? 
Well, when you have a prison system that has a profit motive that seeks to turn a profit off inmates, they want to criminalize more of our behavior. They want to make sure that we don't pass laws that are tied to common sense. They don't want the studies proving that there is medicinal use for marijuana. They just want to criminalize as much as they can so there's a steady flow of inmates into our prison system. And that's exactly what happened. Now, there has been a private prison boom. If you look at the numbers, you'll notice that we have about 130 private prison facilities throughout the United States, and they have the capacity to hold 160,000 individuals. The federal prison population has more than doubled between 2000 and 2010. So the problem keeps getting worse and worse. What's at play? Why is it that these individuals, these CEOs for these for-profit prisons, are able to sway these politicians so easily to criminalize behaviors or fight for certain sentences for crimes that don't really make sense? <laughs> now, if you look at what these private prisons talk about when they meet together, when they have their reports, when they release their reports, you can see that they're very transparent about what they're trying to do. Corrections Corporation of America released a report in 2014, and it said the following. Any changes with respect to drugs and controlled substances or illegal immigration could affect the number of persons arrested, convicted, and sentenced, thereby potentially reducing demand for correctional facilities to house them. So they see that focusing on rehabilitation, that changing our laws and reforming things like illegal immigration will possibly lead to a violation of their bottom line. They were very much concerned that if we legalize marijuana, for instance, what are we gonna do about the inmates? We need to have these people in our facilities in order to make money. So they go to the politicians, they take advantage of legalized bribery here in the United States. In 2010, there was a Supreme Court ruling known as Citizens United. Citizens United allows corporations to act as individuals that have constitutional rights. The Supreme Court decided that if you are a corporation, you are protected and you have political speech. So you have the ability to donate as much money as you want to political action committees. When you do that, maybe politicians are gonna be swayed in their decision making, right? So if you're receiving some money from any corporation, any donor, well, that donor's voice is gonna be a little louder and a little more persuasive than anyone else's. So, you look at the money again, and you notice that since 1989, private prisons have donated a whopping $10 million to campaigns. These are very specific politicians that they seek out and they realize that they can persuade with these dollars. So that's exactly what they do. They give them this money and it has an influence on the laws that they pass. Then there's lobbying. They spent $25 million on lobbying since 1989. How is that different from campaign contributions? Well, what they do is they work with lobbying groups to fight for tough on crime legislation and they want these politicians to pass the legislation because they know that if we have tough on crime laws, more and more people are gonna be funneled into the prison system and their investors will turn a nice profit. So there are results. There is a lot of success that these, five, these private prisons have gotten. And I'm gonna give you some examples right now. One example is Marco Rubio. Marco Rubio is the senator, a senator in Florida, and he is one of the largest recipients of money from private prisons. Okay? He received $40,000 in campaign donations from Geo Group, which is the second largest prison uh, company here in the United States. He also received $6,480 from the CEO of Geo Group. Now, there was a direct result from receiving all that money. Florida, Marco Rubio specifically from Florida, awarded Geo Group a $110 million contract to build a facility in Florida, okay? So they get their facilities, they lobby hard, they get that money from taxpayers, and they build their facilities. But it gets worse than that. They wanna make sure that the contracts that they sign with these states are as sweet as possible so they can make their money. So usually, they'll have something known as a minimum occupancy rate in their contracts. A minimum occupancy rate ensures that these prisons 
have their beds full, okay? They're essentially telling lawmakers in these states, hey, you know what, once we sign these contracts, you have to ensure that 80 to 100% of the beds in our facilities are full. What kind of message that, does that send? So some of you might wonder, what happens if you don't have enough so-called criminals to put to, to, to the prison system? Well, taxpayers end up paying for it anyway. Since it's part of the contract, even if those beds are empty, taxpayers pay for it. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Now, before I get to all the different things that impact us personally as a result of this corrupt justice system, I want to talk about how much money these institutions make. So Geo Group makes a whopping $77 million in profit every year. Corrections Corporation of America makes a whopping $163 million every year. And that's in profit, not in revenue. So after they pay their employees, after they pay for everything, all their overhead, they have $163 million to work with. So it's a very, very lucrative scheme. So it's had an impact on our drug laws. Let's talk about that a little bit. So why is it that we have 3,000 individuals in our prison system right now that are serving life sentences without the chance of parole for nonviolent offenses, many of which are drug crimes, okay? These are people who did not rape, they did not kill, they didn't harm anyone. They're nonviolent offenses and they're serving life behind bars for that crime. It also has an impact on our immigration laws. Whenever there is an election, we hear politicians talk about immigration reform. They really care about immigration reform. They're very concerned about it. But the reality is, one of the reasons why nothing really gets done about reforming immigration and making sure that we create a path to citizenship is because detaining immigrants has become a very lucrative thing for these private prisons. So in Arizona, a few years ago, there was a proposal known as SB 1070. It was known as the show me your papers law. It unfortunately passed, but if you do a little investigating and you figure out who was working behind the scenes to make that law come into fruition, you realize that it's the for-profit prison industry that worked with lobbying groups like ALEC to draft that legislation, to push for that legislation, and lobby for it aggressively enough to the point where it becomes a law. And so what happens is we arrest undocumented immigrants, and you would think, okay, well, we're gonna deport them. But instead of deporting them, we put them in these detention centers that are owned by the private prison industry. And we keep them there for years in some instances. So the big argument when it comes to undocumented immigrants is, oh my God, they're such a huge financial burden for the taxpayers. Well, isn't it a financial burden when we arrest them and detain them in these private prisons for years before we deport them? So when we detain them, keep in mind that nine out of 10 of our ICE detention centers are owned by private prisons, okay? That's our taxpayer money. They say that they're private prisons, but they're funded by us. Finally, there's an issue with sentencing. So in various states, we have things like three strikes and your outlaws, right? We'll have a person who steals a slice of pizza and that's their third crime. And then all of a sudden, they're serving a life sentence for that crime. The reason why that's happening is because those are the types of strict sentencing laws that are lobbied for uh, by private prisons. You also have mandatory minimums, where if you get caught with possession of certain drugs, a judge absolutely has to sentence you to a minimum sentence. Again, that's another thing that these private prisons fight for. They fight for ways to criminalize our behavior, to make us victims of this system so they can turn a profit. When you have a system that has a profit motive, it's a disaster. And the only reason why they have this much sway, this much political influence, is because of money in politics, because of rulings like Citizens United. Now, that's a barrier. You guys all know that at this point. But is there a solution to it? And luckily there is. Now there are various ways to solve this problem. One way of doing so is through legislation. You can push for Congress to draft legislation to get money out of politics. But why would members of Congress, the same individuals that are benefiting from this corrupt system, want to do that? So there is a political action committee referred to as Wolfpack. And 
The reason why I know so much about it is because my boss, uh, the CEO of TYT, is the person behind this. He is the person who came up with this idea and realized there is a way for us to take back our democracy, to get rid of a po corrupt political system. So what he did is he realized, hey, we could have a constitutional convention that will lead to a constitutional amendment that will permanently take money out of politics. It's an ambitious thing to do, especially considering the fact that politicians hate constitutional conventions, they feel very shaky about it, and historically speaking, every time we're about to have a constitutional convention, members of Congress will freak out and they'll pass legislation that will appease people anyway, right? So what we're gonna do with Wolfpack, and it has been pretty successful so far, is lobby in all the states in the US and try to get at least 34 of them to agree to propose and pass a resolution that would lead to a constitutional convention. Once that constitutional convention takes place, as long as 38 states ratify a solution to take money out of politics, it will become part of our constitution. It will be an amendment in our constitution. Again, it's very ambitious, but since Wolfpack started, uh, we succeeded in getting at least four states to not only propose the resolution, but pass it. California is one of them, uh, Illinois, New Jersey, and Vermont. Okay? No one thought we were going to get Vermont to pass this resolution, and they did it. And so we have tens of thousands of volunteers that feel passionately about this. They're not all Democrats. They're not all Republicans. They all have different political views. But the incredible thing about it is, this is a nonpartisan issue. And everyone realizes that we need our representatives to represent us, not to represent big business, not to represent corporations, not represent a system that incarcerates people and ruins their lives for the same actions that our politicians have taken when they were in college. And I love it. I love seeing a, a bipartisan effort to take back our democracy. I hope that you make the decision to take our democracy back and to fight and get political corruption taken care of. Because in reality, I want us to be the land of the free. I want us to be proud of the country we live in. But when we have a country and a government that does not represent us and represents big business instead, that's referred to as fascist. And I'd like democracy a little more than fascism. Thank you.